This morning we continue uh, with our thoughts about the fight for joy. How many of you are experiencing a real fight for joy? Let me see your hands. Have you been experiencing that, right? Uh, man, it's every day it seems like it is a fight for joy. And, and when we look at joy in the scripture, obviously we've been talking about what it is. We've been talking about the foundation of joy is love. We've been talking about the follow-up from joy is peace. We mentioned some of those last week. And this week, going into our next step, the fight for joy is where God has led us in, in our walk together. And so today we're going to look at, if you have your worship guide, joy, it's, it's my response. Joy, and it has to do with my response. So if you don't have a worship guide, if you just lift your hand, one of the guys in the back will get you one. Uh, you can follow along with us in the notes. I think it's important for us to write some things down because for me, I'm, I'm the worst about forgetting things and it just helps my mind to stay where it needs to be. And so today we're going to focus on this, fo on this theme of joy is my response. So if you would go to 2 Samuel this morning, chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6. And as we get started this morning, I wanted you to talk with me a little bit, share with me this morning. And I want you to go with me in your minds to this thought. Moments of joy and your response to that joy. Moments of joy and your response to that joy. All right? So think about some of the greatest moments of joy in your life. How many of you have had some joy? Say, come on. We've had some joy, right? So what are those moments... All right, what are those moments of joy? So let's start out with the ladies. I'm going to start on this side and I'll move this way. So be thinking over there. Ladies in this section or up in the top, what would be a moment of joy? Just give me one word or two words that would kind of um, explain to us an experience or uh, something that brought you joy. A lady over here on my right. On my right over here. Ladies, I'm I, know, I know there's one right there. You're just not saying it. What is one of the things that brings you greatest joy? Coffee, yes, of course. That's not the one I was really thinking of, but coffee works, right? Coffee. Ladies love coffee. Guys love coffee. What, what's one more, ladies? Ladies, help me out. Grandbabies. I was looking for a baby somehow, but that's a grandbaby, right? How many of you got grandbabies, ladies? Let me hear you say, woo. All right, so we've got some grandbabies. We love that. Brings joy, right? And so let's move to the next section. Ladies, someone here, something that brings you joy. Laura? Wedding day, I knew someone would come up with it. I was hoping the guys would get that one, but get some brownie points. All right, well, this section right here, ladies, let me hear you. Birth of a baby, right? Birth of a child, right here, someone over here. Something that brings joy. I'm waiting for a lady to say, when my husband comes home from work. That's what I'm waiting to hear. That's what I was waiting on, right there. Um, guys, let's start on my left, going this way. Something that brings Men joy. Give, give me an answer. Let's start in the top. There's just a few of you, so you're gonna have someone's gonna have to step up up there. Balcony on my left side, guys, men, something that brings you joy. In the top. What is it? Hunting, right? All right. How many of you guys said, ooh yeah, ooh yeah, ooh yeah. Yeah, some hunting brings joy. Did I hear another one? Football. Where's football? All right, okay. Give me another guy right here. Someone that brings joy. I need a man. What is it, Josh? Video games. Video games. We're video game guys. Yeah. Okay, just checking. Right here, joy, guys. I'm talking to the men. Joy, guys. Yes, Charlie. What is it? Golf, right? They had some fun. Some of us, that brings anger, not joy. But um, <laughs> right here, anybody, guys, men, joy. What brings you? Wife. wife. What? Big a big fish. Man, we had some big fish this last couple of days. It was fun, some fun. So joy. Right here, last one. Coming home to wife and kids, right? Uh, there's so much in moments that bring joy. And as you reflect on the moments of joy, I want you to also think about this, your response. Everybody say, my response. What is your response to that joy? The wedding day obviously was mentioned. Several other things were mentioned uh, for uh, our family, and this is kind of just in the sports realm uh, of something that was super joyous as far as you know, we all enjoy a good football game that comes down to the last few minutes. And if your kid's on the field, um, you're just rooting them on, you're going crazy, you're screaming and shouting. Some of you are yelling at the refs, but some of you are screaming for your kids, right? And you're just excited and you're expressing that. And uh, there was a season uh, in Titus's um, high school career and they were uh, a very good team that year, and they were 
you know, kind of thinking they would get a, a season with no loss and they would get the golden ball, right, for the school. And we were in this game. It was against West Union. And then it was at West Union's court, and it was coming down to the last few minutes. We were down by three. And we have um, our, our, uh, our post player, and he's at the center of the court. We only have like two seconds left. They have to throw, right, the, the long half-court half pass in hopes that we can get it off and in hopes it goes in, right? Is everybody with me? A little drum roll? Give me a drum roll out there. A little drum roll. The suspense is high. Don't stop the drum roll. And the ball goes flying through the air. He catches the ball and he launches it. And what happens? He misses. But he was fouled. And I can, can you imagine what the ref felt like when he blew that, blew that whistle? And what the opponent's team coach was saying to that referee? It was truly a foul, but usually they don't call those fouls, right? This young man, this post player, his name was Colton, he goes to the line after a bunch of arguing went on, and he hits all three free throws to tie us up. We go into OT. And um, all the guys, every one of our players had a great game. I think they shared the ball well. They all had uh, double digits and score. But Titus was on the court. And I can't tell you what Stacy was doing because, I mean, I think she went down up and down the bleachers 50 times. But I was fist bumping. And I was, turn it down a little bit. <laughs> I was going nuts, right? I was having at it, right? And, uh. Man, we were celebrating. That was our, what, my, my joy, but it was my response. It was my response to what I was experiencing. It was my response of what I was uh, seeing. It was my response for my son and what was happening on the court, and I was super excited. So moments of joy and your response to that joy, that's where I want your head to go this morning. We all need more joy. We all need to fight more for joy. You could say our issue or our problem is there's things that destroy our joy, things that take our joy. And I want you to go to, keep your place there in 2 Samuel, but I want you to go to Psalms chapter 2. Just keep your place there. We're going to look at one verse in Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. And I want you to maybe mark this verse in some way, maybe put a little um, uh, you know, star there or underline uh, something in this verse, and obviously the, the word that we're looking at here is rejoice, which is a form of the, the word joy. And I want you to read um, this verse. So I'll read the verse first, but then I want you to read it with me. So Psalms chapter 2, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Say it with me. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now this word fear is not this, ooh, I'm afraid fear. This is, I'm in awe fear of who my mighty God is. So seeing God, and it says before this word, uh, the Lord with fear, what is the very first word of the verse? Say it with some heart. What's the very first word of the verse? Serve. To serve the Lord with fear or with allness or with passion. He says, serve the Lord and with trembling. It's not this trembling of fear, but this trembling of not being able to contain yourself. I tell the person next to you, contain yourself. That's what I uh, needed to tell several times in a game to someone next to me. I don't know who that was. You could guess. Contain yourself. She probably had to tell me too a few times. Contain yourself. <laughs> but when we have this outward expression of joy or this outward expression, he says, serve the Lord with fear. And I want you to, to recognize two key words. The word obviously rejoice. And there's some other key words there too. But two, one verse or one word I don't want you to miss is the word serve. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You want some of your greatest joy and some of your greatest fight, listen to me, your greatest fight against someone destroying your joy is serving. Everybody say, I need to serve. I'm telling you, one of the greatest secrets of your Christian walk is not only every day in the Word, but every week being in some format of service to the Lord. Because this last couple days as we were with the men, we were able to serve one another. And it brought great joy to the men as a group. And I know a lot of men couldn't be there, and we all wanted you to be there. I'm looking forward to next year and hoping everyone that can, can go. 
But this word rejoice, I want you to write this little word next to it in, the, in your margin there. The word, spell it this way. It's the original word G-I-L, gill. Everybody say, I got some gill. I got some gill or I need some gill. One of the two, either you got it or you need it. It's going to be one of the two. And it says, serve the Lord with fear and gill. Gill means to spin around in a circle. Woo! I thought that was pretty good. You guys didn't even clap or nothing. Woo! Right? To spin around in a circle, man, you can't contain yourself. You've all been there, but you know what? A lot of times we contain ourselves when it comes to this house. But when we go to the gymnasium house or the arena house, we so many times contain ourselves. We're like, oh, well, I can't, I can't do that. And you know what? This is, this is the bad thing. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in the notes, but we either go one extreme or the other, or we're so reserved, or we get so emotional that it's not for real and it's not heartfelt. It's just an outward expression, and you're just kind of caught up in your emotions. And both of them are wrong. Both of them are an extreme. You know where the perfect middle is? Heartfelt. And that's what you're going to see this morning with David as we go through this passage, that he had heartfelt worship and he had heartfelt joy. So I want you to remember, Gil means this, to spin around in a circle. And many times we need to stop containing ourselves. And David refers to rejoicing with trembling, to rejoice where he's not containing himself. Remember as a kid, maybe as a parent, when you told your your, your your kids that you're going to this very fun place, whether that was King's Island or whether you said Disney World or whether you said you're going to get a puppy or when maybe it was them opening their favorite gift at Christmas, what did, they, what did they do? They spun around in a circle for joy. Or they went just crazy. I remember uh, um, Tori would just scream to the top of her lungs when she got so excited at Christmas. I want to tell us this morning that we need some gill. Everybody say, I need some gill. So in review, we talked about total joy is total obedience. We talked about week two, joy moves when God moves. Today we're talking about joy is my response. And so I want us to, we look at today that response of me and you, the response that we can see reflected in David. And before we can address really uh, his response and joy must also, first of, all, first of all, look at and discuss his difficulty to see, number one, joy, my response, but first of all, in that process, we must see David's difficulty. David's difficulty. When you look at David's difficulties, David had many difficulties meant to destroy him and would have uh, given him many reasons to quit the fight for joy. How many of you have wanted to quit your fight for joy? Can I see a hand? You've wanted to quit the fight for joy. I've been with you. And there's many difficulties that try to destroy David, and they, they also try to destroy us and give us many reasons to quit. Think about David for just a minute. 17 years. Everybody say 17 years. That's over 6,000 days hiding, running, fighting to survive from King Saul. And the Philistines attack in just the previous chapter. If you go to your 2 Samuel place now, just the chapter before in chapter 5, he's attacked. As soon as he becomes king, he becomes king, immediately he's attacked by the Philistines. And just a few days go by and he's attacked again. He inquires of the Lord, and that's a whole other Bible study of what happens there, but he is attacked twice, back to back. Then in the first part of chapter 6, where we're going to be today, we find that Yuza dies. Yuza is where the, the, um, the ark was kept. This is the whole process. If you read chapter 5 and 6, David's heart, everybody say heartfelt. David's true heartfelt response is found in these two chapters. And when you find David here, he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is a representation, if you remember, church, is a representation of the presence of God. And this represent, representation of the presence of God is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, and he wants to bring it to the city of Jerusalem. And he wants the people of God to be in the presence of God. Isn't that what you long for? Isn't that what you desire? Isn't that where joy is alive? In your life, can you say amen? That's where joy, listen to me, 
That's where joy is going to be alive in the presence of God. And David knows this, and it's been too long that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, has not been in the center of attention in the children of Israel. And so David's going to move it. Uzziah dies, which Uzziah is the son of, of the man who had been keeping the Ark. And it's a devastating situation. And I want us to realize that David had many difficulties meant to destroy him. And he would have given up many times and had many reasons to quit. But I want us just to, to notice here the extreme highs and the extreme lows. I want us to notice here the, the extreme highs and the extreme lows. How many of us can relate with this? Say, come on. We can all relate with this. We've all had extreme highs. And we've all had extreme lows. David, in just these 20 verses previous to uh, where we're going to be today, starting in verse 12, so much has happened in this way of extreme highs and lows. David had uh, his tough times, and obviously that is, is certain, but in this particular season of his life, if you look at some of the Psalms, even on the, on the men's trip, we looked at Psalms 54, and, and we talked about Psalms 46, and we talk about all these different Psalms, and in these different Psalms, you can see the lows. Uh, David's confession, David's anger, David's confusion, but he also had guilt. He also had this joy. And we all can relate to this. We all have many difficulties and multiple reasons. Every one of you have multiple reasons to quit the fight for joy. We all have enemies, or we have obviously the greatest enemy, uh, Satan himself, the devil himself against us. We had one of our men this week trust Christ as his Savior, and we're all praying for him. We're all praying for him because we know the fight that will be against him internally for his decision. But God will carry him through. We will support him, and we will walk with him. And so through these highs and these extreme lows and, these, and David's difficulty, I now want us to see as we go into verse 12, I want us to see David's response. David's response. As we go together, verse 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom. That's where the ark was at. And all that pertaineth unto him. I want us to notice, I want you to just let this sink in. The presence of God is where the blessing of God will be. And he goes on to say, And so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with what? With gladness, or you could say joy. God's word, when it's obeyed and his holiness is respected, as we look at the ark, there's always blessing. In verse 13, And it was so that when they that bear the ark had gone six paces, after they arrive in the city and they go six paces, they stop and he sacrifices oxen and fatlings. And we're going to still go here a little bit, but I want you to see the elaborate or the excessive or you could say over-the-top response. He didn't contain himself. He gives everything he has in worship to show his gratefulness. And look what it says in verse 14, and David danced. Everybody say, David danced. David had gill. He spun in a circle and celebrated the presence of God. He's not celebrating being King David. Listen to me. He's not celebrating being King David. He's not celebrating his promotion. He's celebrating what church? The presence of God. And all of us long for the presence of God, and it should cause us to dance at the presence of God because of who he is before the Lord. And with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. And in verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with what? With shouting. With all the, and with the sound of the trumpet. I want us to notice all that is happening here. I want us to talk about these couple of verses here for just a minute. There is dancing. There is dancing before the ark, and we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. But just as that celebration that we would um, remember or the joys that we were, would remember when we got so um, joyous that we couldn't contain it. That's where David is because the presence of God is being moved to the city of David or Jerusalem. They're shouting, they're singing. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge was a verse that we talked about just a couple of days ago. If we go to the verse that we talked about, John 15, 11, I hope you've been meditating on that and been memorizing that, all right? I remind you, John 15, uh, 11, these things have I written unto you, that my joy, Jesus' joy, might remain. Everybody say remain. It might remain in you. It's not going to go anywhere. It's there. It's settled. It's, it's settled. It's not moving. Remain in you that your joy might be full. Man, I want some full joy, don't you? And that full joy comes from full obedience, and we talked about that, but I want you to notice that this joy can remain and you can see David's response with dancing, with shouting. And then I want you to notice in verse 13 that we read, and we talked about it briefly, the elaborate, excessive, over-the-top uh, offerings, you could say here. It was not out of obli- obligation here. It was out of a, a heartfelt worship. And you can see uh, not only the, the response is dancing, that we saw there in this first couple verses, we can see the dancing, but then we can see B, the shouting. So David's response is A, it is dancing. B, it is shouting. And C, is generously giving. If you guys would help me on the screen, it's not working for me down here. So we have dancing, then we have shouting, and then we have generously giving. Look at verse 17. And they brought in the ark of the Lord, or you could say the presence of the Lord, and they set it in his place. Say those last couple words, set it in his place. Say it with me again, set it in his place. I remind us that when love is the foundation, we have new um, motivation, right? We have new objectives in our life, and we have new priorities in our life. And I want you to notice that David sets it in its place. I can remember going to uh, my dad's office, and he was so particular, and everything had to be in its place, right? Anybody like that in here? Say, come on. You like that? How many of you people like that annoy you? Say, come on, right? Everything's got to be in its place. Don't move that pencil. I mean, if you wanted to annoy my dad, you just had to move something in the office, right? But it's set in its place. I want you to notice that it was here for a reason. This is, these are two offerings of fellowship. I want you to notice that in this verse. These are not offerings to other things, but these are offerings reflecting, reflecting fellowship. And so he offered the, the, offered the burnt offering and the peace offering before the Lord. And it was set in this place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched or prepared for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. I want you to see his generous, generously giving to God first. Everybody say God first. It's a biblical principle all over the pages of the Bible that he gave to the Lord first. It wasn't always in a way of money, but it was in a way of offering, in a way of worship that he gave his first to the Lord. And then you can see it's to others. Look at verse 18. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the who? He blessed the people in the name, not in his name, but in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, is who he blessed them in. In verse 19, and look what it says. And he dealt among, or he gave among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as the men, the women as men, both men and women, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh. And all the men said, Amen. Amen. And a flaxen of wine, which means a raisin cake, is what that was. Everybody like some cake? Say, come on. And so all the people departed, everyone into his house. I want you to notice that he generously gave first to God, and then he generously gave to others. And the fourth thing he did, he contagiously was leading. So he was generously giving, but now we see he's contagiously leading. And I want you to see this in verse 19. As we just read that, how that his giving led to others' giving. His leading in his worship, his leading in his response caused others to respond. And every one of us, every man in here wants his house to respond to the presence of God. And all the men said, we want our families to respond to the presence of God. Listen to me this morning. How will you respond? Will you go to the presence of God? Will you want the presence of God as we see David so passionately about here because it changed who he was and his response was in dancing, shouting, and giving, and now leading others in that. We all want to be able to relate to being that good leader that we need to be. Whether man or woman or home, both of you are leaders. 
We don't need just ladies in our church to, to be good leaders. We need men in our church to be good leaders. And we need to lead our families into the presence of God. We need to lead them into generously giving. We need to lead them into leading their next generation in joy and celebration. And this last thing I want you to see, number three, is David's fight. Found in verse 16 and then also 20 through 22, again we see uh, an immediate difficulty met him to destroy his joy. As soon as his joy was expressed, a difficulty was just around the corner. Again, extreme high and extreme low. Every day and every step and every week of your life, it's going to be a fight for joy. The fight for Gil. To, be not, to not contain yourself, but, but to be able to feel the presence of God and, and the joy to be your response because immediately after the difficulty, uh, or as soon as that difficulty came, it came to destroy his joy. Tell the person next to you right now, don't be destroying my joy. Keep your joy, listen to me, keep your joy no matter who tries to take it. Under David's fight, I want us to see A here. Sometimes others will not understand our response. Listen to me. Sometimes people will not understand your response. If you are dwelling and living in the presence of God and you're the, your focus is this heartfelt worship and you're, you're in those steps, sometimes others will not understand your response. This morning, I want you to understand what I'm saying. You see, David's response, we're going to see in verse 16, it talks about the king's royal robe. And I want you to look at verse 16 real quick. Notice this. David's wife does not understand his response. In verse 16, And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael Saul's, Michael Saul's daughter looked through a window, so she's in this elevated place where she can see all these things happening, and saw, saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. Notice that last phrase. This is just so difficult to even read. She despised him where? In her heart. You know, there's a lot of times inside a family, this, this, this spirit of despise comes to be a part. It can happen in a church. It can happen in a workplace. It can happen in a home. It can happen in a friendship. It can happen anywhere. But I want you to realize why it happened because she did not understand David's response. King David set aside his royal robe. So if we could say this is King David's royal robe this morning. I noticed there's a couple guys wearing black shirts. Kervin, come up here and help me. Um, Seth, come here and help me. You shouldn't wear black. It's your own fault. Um, I saw Jacle come up here and help me. Who the hell is, oh, look at Jerry's got a, is that gray or black? You might get, it's blue, you're lucky. Who's in the back row back there? He's hiding, I don't think he wants to come. I think we can do it with these guys. Come here, guys. Why don't you stand right here? Um, Seth, put you on this side of me. Kervin right here, and Jaclay right there. Thanks for helping me, guys. Appreciate it. So David has his royal robe, right? And these other men are with me, and we're walking in, and we're celebrating what? The ark of God, the presence of God. Can everybody tell who King David is? It's pretty easy to tell, isn't it? What does King David do? He sets this aside. You know what he's saying? Put your arms around each other. He says, I'm just like one of you. My heart beats for the presence of God just like these men. Let's do a little dance. Come on. <laughs> just one over the other. Come on. I'll get it right. Come on, Kervin, help us. You know how to do this. Not very good at we, need some, we need some lessons. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Give us a hand, guys. Come on. We're dancing for Jesus up here. All right. But King David, that's what his wife is talking about. 
He humbled himself. He didn't want to be, I truly believe you got to stay here. He didn't want to be out front, out here dancing for Jesus all by himself in his royal robe so everybody could see. He just wanted to blend in because he wanted to be just like one of these other guys because he had a humble beginning just like all of them. Do you see what I'm saying? A lot of people think David um, was in his skibbies dancing out in front of everybody doing a solo performance, and he was not. I truly believe he took off his royal robe, and he was just like one of his other men. He didn't want to stand out. He wanted to be with his men. Thank you, guys. And so I say to us this morning, are we willing to take off our, our royal robe of self-righteousness, right? We've been talking a little bit about that. Am I going to take uh, and, and humble myself and say, God, I so desire your presence, and sometimes others will not understand your response. King David sets aside his royal robe and dressed like every other person that was there with his men. And David did this for a reason. David's dance, like we said, was not the solo performance. Sometimes as God moves, others will not understand. Listen to me. Sometimes when God moves, there'll be others that will not understand. If you've experienced this, say amen. amen. And their responses may seem, listen, their responses may seem to work contrary to God's work in your life. So when God moves in your life and you follow that in obedience and your obedience gauge goes up and your joy gauge follows it, remember there's a short delay. When your obedience happens, your joy is just a slight delay behind it. And when our obedience go down, goes down, what happens to our joy, church? It starts to go down. It's a slight delay, but you're going to feel it. And I want us to notice that sometimes others will not understand, and their response may seem to work contrary to what we originally are thinking that God is saying to us in the movement of God in our life. And I want you to notice something. This is very small, but I want you to notice that his wife was looking down on him. Men, women, husbands, wives alike. Let's not be looking down on our mate. Let's not be looking down on a friend. Let's not be looking down on another man in our church, men. Let's not be looking down, ladies, on another lady in our church. But let's get our eyes up and seek and follow the presence of God and realize there'll be sometimes we won't understand other people's responses, and that's okay. And we need to be willing to say, they are worshiping God. I know they're heartfelt. I know God is leading them, and I'm okay with whatever God shows them they need to do. You can see that David is legitimate in his joy. It's real. It's heartfelt. David shows humility through his joy. He's not out in front. He's blending in, and that's why she is so upset. It's not because he was worshiping, I don't think. It was because she, he set aside his royalty. And it was about who he was and not what he was doing. I truly believe that's where her mind and heart was at in this particular moment. So sometimes people are just not going to understand God's movement in your life. Sometimes others are unwilling to see God's movement. Sometimes people are, are, are unwilling to see God's movement be in your notes. Sometimes this is going to happen. Sometimes others are unwilling to see uh, what God has done. Remember the four words we've been talking, talking about? Look what God did, right? What about this one? Look what God's doing, right? Not only look what God did, but look what he's doing. And sometimes others are unwilling to see God's movement. And there's a reason why for that. Sometimes they're unwilling to see God and what he has done because of their emotions, listen to me, their emotions of a predated situation. They have let their past destroy their joy, and so now they are seeing your joy in a light that it's not to be seen in. See, sometimes others will try to find fault in your response or in our response. What do I mean by that? Sometimes others will find fault in our response, and sometimes it's to do with uh, trying to investigate your response. They're spending so much time investing investigating your response and why you're doing things the way you're doing instead of just looking at their own heart and their own life. They investigate, they criticize what has been done and they try to find fault in your joy. <laughs> Seems weird, doesn't it? I say, that's weird. It happens. 
And we've all experienced it, and guess what? We've all done it. If we look hard enough in our past, we'll see where we were judging or criticizing someone else's response in their walk and their joy. I want you to see verse 21 and 22. And David said to his wife, Michael, notice these words, it was before the Lord. I didn't do it for you. I didn't do it for any other reason. Fill in the blank. It was before the Lord which chose me. I want you to notice that David realizes that it is God that has a purpose for his life. He has asked me, he has chosen me, he has given me a purpose, he's given me this next step in my job. And guys, it doesn't matter what job you have, God is leading in that. Let him lead. And when he leads you, keep taking those steps. Allow him to bring that joy because of your obedience, not because of where you work. Let him take care of what you're doing and why you're doing it. He says here in this verse, he says, I know that God has asked me to do this. He's chosen me to do this job ahead of me. And it's not the father... Uh, it's not thy father before all the house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. And he says, God has appointed me. God has asked me to do this. God has a purpose. And then he says this at the very, at very end. Therefore, because of this, this is what I'm saying. I will play before the Lord or I will worship before the Lord. Can you say amen, church? Now there's one more verse you've got to see. Verse 22. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base, or will humble myself in mine own sight. And of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be, I be had in honor. He says, you know, you think I did something wrong by setting aside that royal garment to, to just be who I am before my men and before God? And you think that there's going to be an issue here? Let me tell you that I did this not for you, but I did it for the Lord. And here's what I want you to see. Your takeaway today. My response is my responsibility. You should be able to say in your heart, in your life, my response is my responsibility. And here's what I'm asking us today. Is what is your response? Is your response to humble yourself and to take off that self-righteousness that you may be having and say, God, I, I give humbly to you and I, I want to be these things that you want me to be. I want to um, do as David did. I want to dance. I want to shout. I want to give. I want to lead. I want to be who you want me to be. And God, I don't want to give up the fight. I don't want to quit. And I'm going to fight for my joy. And so I'm going to take responsibility for my response, like David and all his difficulties and reasons to quit. He still fights for joy, even when people attempt to pull away his joy. Even his own wife attempts to take away his joy. And a lot of times we can reverse the story of Scripture, and it's the husband that's trying to take the wife's joy. And then sometimes it's the kids trying to take the parents' joy, and sometimes it's the parents trying to take the kids' joy or the youth's joy. We've got to quit destroying each other's joy and we have to realize that their response is their responsibility and my response is my responsibility. Like David, we all have the ability, listen to this as I finish. Like David, we all have the ability and the capacity to respond. Can you say amen? You have the ability and the capacity to respond. But what will I do? Listen, some of us are becoming numb to the presence of God. We all have been there. I have been there. And this is the fight. Everybody say, it's the fight. It's the fight for joy. Joy is a gift. Love is, love is the foundation. It changes my motives, my objectives, my priorities. And it all changes because I finally say, okay, it's, I have the capacity. I have the ability to respond. But will I respond? Or will I be numb in my response? Sometimes your response is not to respond. And that's not what you need to be doing. You need to respond to him. I have no doubt in my mind that every morning, God, by his presence, calls you to himself. Every morning, God's presence calls you to himself. But how will I respond to his call? Listen, 
I have no doubt if someone is not sure that they're saved, they've never deliberately asked Jesus to be their Savior, and you're seated in this sanctuary this morning, there's by no doubt that God's presence calls you to come to Him so you can be saved. You may not recognize what the Spirit is saying, but if you're lost, the Spirit, according to the Scripture, is drawing your heart to trust in Him for your eternal destination and the forgiveness that you need because we all need forgiveness. It doesn't matter who we are. And so this morning, my response is my responsibility. We all have the capacity and the ability to respond. And so like David, will we be Will we be able to say, I will be responsible for my response? I ask you this morning, will you dance? Will you shout? Will you give generously? Will you lead contagiously? And I ask you this, will you actually respond? And I'm not talking about the time of response that we're about to have here, but I'm talking about tomorrow morning. And this whole week, will you respond in the fight for your own joy? And get yourself out of the way so the Spirit can have its way. And this morning, if you're lost without Jesus, this morning come and say, hey, I got questions. I don't know where I'm going to be in eternity. I don't know why Jesus died. Can someone explain this to me? Because this morning, don't become numb to who the Spirit is. Become numb to the draw of the call of the Spirit. Be like David and seek to bring the presence of God to the center of your life. So let's lead together. Let's give together, let's shout together, let's sing together, and let's dance together. Would you bow for a word of prayer this morning?